Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for taking time out and being here on Sunday morning. And my name is Ayong. I am the host for this webinar. And also I am the marketing and educational seminar coordinator here at Neobiotech USA. And today's agenda is very simple. I will introduce our topic and the presenter and also make an announcement right after the lecture in regard to upcoming webinar and watch previous webinars and also how to receive your CE credits. So please don't leave and stay until the end. And our topic today is implant overdonture treatment planning, surgical and restorative guidelines with Dr. Owen Train. And also we are strong, strongly recommended to use the chat box to communicate with me, uh, host. And we will also have a Q&A session at the end. So please submit your questions through this Q&A box and Dr. Chun will answer your questions. And one thing that I wanna address is Dr. Chun may not answer all of your questions since we have a short period of time. Um, if you have more questions, then you can connect Dr. directly through his email or you can contact JO. So let's have Dr. Chun to start today's webinar. And please welcome Dr. Chun. Good, good morning, Dr. Chun. Good morning, Anyan. Good morning, Dr. And please take over. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Let me start sharing my screen with you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Owen Trin. Um, first off, I want to thank you, all of you, for um, taking the time out of your rest of Sunday to attend the seminars. And um, I hope that you and your loved ones, um, as well as your staff, continue to stay safe and healthy. Um, some information about myself. Um, I currently practice and teach um, the AHED program in the Air Force um, as part of my way back uh, commitment for the health scholarship. Um, I also practice part time in civilian practice. Um, I did my training in Oregon and um, subsequently prosthetic training in Minnesota, where I had a lot of exposure to both um, periodontal as well as prosthetic procedures that involve grafting, placing, and restore implant for um, simple to complex uh, full arc treatments. And um, I obtained my board certification immediately after graduation. Um, my email is listed on the screen in case um, you need to contact me after the presentations. So what we will cover today is the implant overdenture treatment modality. And we will talk about what you need to know in terms of treatment planning, um, surgical and restorative guidelines. So an overdenture treatment can be for either upper or lower jaw or both. Um, the simplest overdenture is the lower overdentures retained by two anterior implants. And the McGill consensus statement uh, from the Toronto um, Global Dental Conference in the early 2000s um, stated that an overdenture with two implants should be the standard of care over the traditional complete denture. Um, the basic premise of um, mandibular overdenture is to have the dentures um, snap on either ball locator abutments or cylindrical locator abutments, as you can see on the screen. And they can snap on the titanium bar that connected the two implants together. That will be another option. Uh, so when you use cylindrical locator abutments, the metal housing itself inside the dentures, they hold is the silicon nylon inserts. Whereas when you use the ball locators abutment, the metal housing hold the silicone O-ring inserts. Um, and please know that when you have just two anterior implants, the denture is retained by the two anterior implant in the anterior, but is still supported by bone and soft tissue in the posterior. So the obvious question is when the patient, you know, is what happened when the patient just get by with um, a traditional dentures um, that supports solely by bone and soft tissue. Um, studies show that on average, four millimeters of vertical bone loss occurred during the first year after the extractions and the patient wear denture without any assistance from implant, this bone loss continued to occur, and the edentulous mandible um, experienced four times of four times greater vertical bone loss than the maxilla. Um, in contrast, uh, minimal bone resorption um, of the anterior residual ridge occurs with the placement of two anterior implants, 
Um, as a matter of fact, a 15 year um, prospective study by Adele and colleagues in the International Journal of Oral Surgery showed that the bone under an overdenture resolved as little as uh, 0.6 millimeters vertically over five years, and the long term resorption might be even less than 0 0.05 millimeters per year. Um, in addition, the denture teeth position can be positioned in the most aesthetic position without any restriction from the severely resorbed or severely atrophied resi residual ridge crest. Um, the reason is because the stability is now, the stability of the denture is now provided by the implants and does not depend on the, the ridge form or the crest of the ridge. Um, irregular dentures may move as much as 10 millimeters horizontally under lateral forces. Um, you know, which cause soft tissue abrasion and accelerate bone loss. Um, whereas an implant retained over the denture, it limits the lateral movements and direct the forces more vertical to the ridge crest. Um, other significant benefits of, of um, the over dentures are first, the chewing deficiency of an implant over dentures uh, is improved as much as 20% compared to the traditional complete dentures. Uh, when you use the, um, the independent ball or locator abutment attachment, the way the attachment snap onto the locators enable them to act as a stress relief to the implants. And um, compared to the fixed implant treatment, an overdenture with two implants, um, as a matter of fact, require fewer implants. And the majority of the cases, you will el limit the need for extensive bone grafting procedure. Um, also, the patient incurred much lower initial treatment costs and the prosthesis itself is much easier to be repaired and relined by the laboratory. And an overdenture may also serve as a transitional prosthesis um, until additional implant can be placed for um, either a removable or a, a fixed implant prosthesis treatment. Um, the disadvantages of overdentures are first, you know, the, the patient might not get over the hurdle of wearing a removable prosthesis. So there's some psychological aspect to that. Um, the manipulative overdenture wear might incur greater long-term expense. Um, the locator abutment and the attachment need to be replaced regularly. Um, a new overdenture is required um, to be replaced, you know, from five to seven years increment because the denture teeth wear and soft tissue um, changes. And because of those reasons, short and long-term maintenance costs um, should be communicated clearly to the patient before you initiate the treatment. Um, another disadvantage um, with overdenture is the anterior posterior rotation, which I will discuss on the next slide. Um, and despite having, you know, um, this, despite experiencing way much less bone loss than comparing to conventional dentures, patients with an overdenture will continue to have posterior bone loss because, again, you, you know, in the posterior segment, you still have, you know, bone and soft tissue supporting the dentures. Um, and because of that, um, the bone loss in the posterior uh, region might, you know, accelerate two to three times faster than the, you know, com with patient in with complete dentures. Um, and in contrast to that, the patient with a fixed implant supported prosthesis uh, like an R and X show no bone loss or even have bone apposition in the posterior regions. And because of that, um, implant retained over dentures should not be looked at as the end result but rather we should aim to have an implant supported over dentures uh, for the patients um, as they progress throughout the treatment. Um, another question that our um, edentures patient might ask us is be between the removable option like the over dentures and the fixed option like an all and x treatment, which one is better for them? Um, the answer to that is it depends on where you practice dent dentistry, right? And it also depends on your patient budget. The initial cost of the um, RNX treatment tend to be a lot higher than the overdenture treatment with two or more implants. And the financial aspect might steer your patient and the clinician to a, a removal option like an overdenture. And some patients might prefer an implant overdenture because they want to be able to remove the denture and clean it. So if you want to learn more about the details regarding an RNX treatment options, um, I did a webinar with Neo Biotech about a month ago regarding the RNX treatments. So you are welcome to watch it online. Um, so now I want to kind of mention with, um, I want to mention that with the overdenture option, if you add two or more implants in the posterior regions, then the overdenture is no longer implant retained but with more implant in the, in the posterior, at that point, the denture is fully um, supported by the implant. So I just wanna make sure that it's clear to everyone. 
So now um, let's talk about the treatment planning aspect of overdenture treatment. Um, in terms of implant placement position, uh, there are three major requirements that you need to follow. So the first is the proper implant position for overdentures um, is in the lateral incisal position and not in the canine position because in the canine position, it allows greater forward, um, greater anterior posterior rocking motion of the dentures um, than compared to the uh, implant in the lateral incisal position. Mm -hmm. So ideally, we want to place implant between the lateral and the canine position. And with the two implant overdentures, when do we splint the implant with a connecting bar and when we not splinting them? Well, the explanation is pretty simple. Um, first, locator abutment attachment are independent by the fact that they are not splinted by a bar, right? So, and according to MISH, the, lake, the locator attachment system permit all ranges of motions, whereas the two to three implants splinted with hater or dota bar permit only vertical and hinge motion um, movements. And a five-year multi-center prospective study by JAMS um, show that a bar over dentures offer um, greater implant stability and support and higher occlusion drilling forces as compared to the two implant independent over dentures. Um, however, um, Kackner and Nader show that um, individual um, with over denture attachment system like locators um, can even match or even exceed the retention forces uh, offered with a bar over dentures. And um, Nader's um, 10 year study with dodo bar and metal clips overdenture showed that most prosthetic complications re related to um, bar overdenture was caused by loose of retention, uh, loose retention, which occurred about 10% of the time. Um, also, the, when you have anterior joint forces, the dentures in a two implant overdentures um, treatment options, the denture itself acts as a splint for the implant. Um, and thereby relieve a lot of occlusal stresses onto the implants. So the bottom line is, if you have adequate retention and stability with two independent locator abutments, then the need to have um, the implant splinted with a hater or dodo, or dodo bar is not necessary. And secondly, in a taper or V arch shape, um, a V shape arch, um, splinting, splinting the two implant with a bar might not be indicated because the position of the bar might be too far um, anterior or too far lingual, um, which might cause interfering with speech and mastications. Um, and according to Mish, a good rule of thumb when making a decision to either splint or not splint over dentures, um, implant is by determining uh, if you have uh, an ideal posterior ridge form because a wide posterior ridge form with um, adequate buccal shell can um, serve as an excellent primary support area for the overdenture. And how do treatment plan and how do we treatment plan the overdenture implant surgery in implant planning software? So basically to do this, um, we need to have a reference plane to determine the implant position. Um, the coronal position of the implant um, so we need to we need to have a reference plan to determine the implant position as well as the coronal position of the implant and determine if um, we need to remove the crestal bone to achieve adequate um, restorative space. Um, the current technique that being used is called a dual scan technique, and the reference plane I'm referring to is the location and the incisal edge position of the anterior denture teeth. So if your patient has an existing lower dentures or a um, or an immediate denture that has adequate teeth position for occlusion, aesthetic, and phonetics, then you would use that denture for scanning protocol I'm about to show you. And if not, then you would need to make a new trial denture for the patient to do that. So the first step is placing sticky radio, uh, radio peg marker on your dentures. The first cone beam scan is with the patient wearing the dentures. And the second cone beam scan is the scan of the denture by itself using certain special um, scanning setting on your combi machine to scan the dentures. So the first scan produced the patient anatomy with the location of um, the individual radiopaque markers. And the second scan produces the denture with radiopaque markers as one solid object. The radiopaque markers allow you to kind of merge the two scan together in one single scan by having um, the software help lining up the radio plate markers 
as, as, as they appear on the scan. <clears throat> so when you have the combined scan, you will be able to select your implant size and make your measurement for the restorative space and the amount of bone reduction required. And as described by study by um, Aker and Lee, for locator abutment, um, the minimum vertical space from the osseous crest, meaning from top of the bone to the outer surface of the acrylic is eight and a half millimeters without including the height of the denture teeth. And this measurement consists of having 1.8 millimeters of soft tissue thickness, um, a 1.5 millimeters height for the shortest um, locator abutments, and a 3.2 millimeters height for the attachment cap, which is the metal housing cap that I showed you um, at the very beginning, as well as having a two millimeters of acrylic above the attachment in order to hold the attachment in place. Uh, Mish also suggests us that the total restorative space from the crestal bone to, a, to the occlusal plane need to be more than 12 millimeters in order to resist um, fractures and to allow adequate space to set denture teeth without having to modify the position of the teeth, as well as having adequate room for the attachment and the soft tissue. Um, in most cases, crestal bones reduction is meant to get adequate restorative space, but in some, in, um, some instances, crestal bone reduction is to create a platform, which we call a mandibular shelf, um, that is wide enough for us to place the implants in situation where you have a knife edge ridge, such as the one you see on your left side. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I will point out to you when I showed um, sample cases um, in a little bit later what a mandibular shelf means. And as you can see, um, this is the, the vertical requirement for the implant position. Um, of course, there is a horizontal arrangement requirement, which I will explain when I show you the sample cases also. And um, before we um, review sample treatment cases, um, another important thing we need to know is how the implants perform when they are used with overdentures and what type of data we have or um, that already have been reported in the literature. And Earlier study by um, Inquest reported about six to seven percent implant failures for mandibular overdentures implants, um, and nineteen to thirty-five percent failures for maxillary implants overdentures. And in the five-year prospective study by James, um, he also showed him and his colleague also show a ninety percent um, survival rate for mandibular overdentures implants, uh, compared to a seventy-three percent survival rate for maxillary implants due to a poor quality of bone in the maxilla. Um, these two studies were done with older Brennemark type of implants. However, um, more recent studies um, have shown a 97 to even 1% success for overdenture implants. Um, MISH even report less than 1% of implant failure as a matter of fact. Um, other studies show 99% of implant survival. And please keep in mind that the improvement in the implant survival and success um, when used with overdentures were the result of having better implant design over time, as well as um, improvements in treatment protocol and having the advance um, in CAD CAM in terms of precise milling and thus better fitting for the um, hater and the, dough, uh, and the dough bars. So to summarize this slide, the reality is that many studies over the last two decades have concluded that um, the implant retained over denture is a valid and a um, successful treatment option for our denture patients. Um, particularly with the overdenture retained by just two anterior implants. All right, um, so it's now time for me to share a few case samples with you. And um, I try to use these examples to help me connect the point and kind of bring some clarity to what I have tried to emphasize earlier. So the first case involved um, an older female patient who missing teeth in multiple places. Um, she had issue with periodontal disease, um, recurrent caries, as well as root caries. And she wanted to have a more aesthetic, pleasing smile without um, spending a fortune. Um, so a maxillary complete dentures and a mandibular over dentures was a suitable solution for her. So after the patient healed from the extraction, um, the implant surgery was performed freehand. And in order for me to have um, an idea of the amount of crestal bone I need to reduce, as well as uh, have an idea of the position to place the implants, um, I, use a, I utilize a duplicate copy of the uh, 
of her immediate dentures with um, having a rectangular window cut out on the lingual side um, so to allow me um, to have access and visibility. And as you can see, um, after performing the crestal bone reduction to gain adequate restorative space, I basically had created a flat crestal bone platform that was wide enough for the implant placement. And this basically what I meant by having, um, by creating a mandibular shelf. And this is the panel wrap taken after the implant surgery. And I want to show this um, to emphasize the importance of placing the implants in the lateral incisor position. And ideally, you want to place the implant between the lateral incisor and the canine position. And after the surgery, um, suturing was done and the patient was allowed to heal for two months before um, second stage surgery was performed to expose the implant. Um, and after that, locator abutment was connected to the implants. And at that point, the patient was ready to um, move on to the final impression, so to fabricate a definitive overdenture. So this is the patient's um, final impression and her um, definitive mandibular overdentures. Um, I want to emphasize that because an overdenture is retained by um, the anterior implant, but still supported by bone and soft tissue in the posterior, the denture form and extension should follow the exact guideline of a, rec of a regular complete denture. So you would want to do um, you know, excellent border molding and selective impression technique you would do for a regular complete denture. Um, this photo is of the patient with the definitive prosthesis, um, which include a maxillary complete denture and a uh, mandibular overdenture. So moving on to a second case sample, um, this case involved an elderly um, Caucasian man who um, had very few teeth left. And prior to seeing me, um, he has severe partial dent, he has a partial denture, several partial denture made, but none of the partial denture could get adequate retention and support because, you know, apparently there's lack of um, abutment teeth and severe bone loss and very shallow lingual vestibule to help uh, with stability of the partial dentures. Um, and he also had two remaining mandibular teeth removed by the previous provider. <clears throat> and after reviewing our treatment option with the gentleman, um, he decided to receive, again, a maxillary complete dentures and a mandibular overdenture. So on the left side of the screen is the video recorded during the implant surgery for the patients using Neobiotech Drill Stop implant kit, as well as their um, IS-3 implants. Um, I want to use this video to demonstrate to you um, the horizontal arrangement requirement when placing, um, when planning and placing overdenture implants. And according to the literature, beside having the implant being equally distant from the midline, uh, from the patient midline, Another horizontal requirement when placing an overdenture implant is to avoid placing one implant more anterior to the other, um, as you can see from the picture on the right. So the important, so so the implant arrangement on the right photo is not what you want to achieve. Um, the reason is because when this happens, the more distal implants or the more posterior implants of the two will act as a fulcrum when the patient chew in the posterior, and when uh, and the more anterior imp implant will also act as a fulcrum when patient chew in the anterior. And this effect caused instability and wear of the nylons inserts and the locator abutments. So we don't want that for the patient. Um, another, as another aspect that can be very, very difficult to control is the position of the implant relative to the position of the mandibular um, anterior denture teeth. And as shown um, by Kimoto in his 2009 study in the Clinical Implantology Restoration Journal, um, this relation is one of the major factors in controlling the rotational movement of the, uh, of the overdenture. And the author showed that um, for, every, um, millimeter, for every millimeter of teeth placed anterior to the locator abutments, there is one and a half times greater likelihood that the overdenture will rotate. So, if we intend to use the temporary denture as a template for our implant surgery, we need to make sure that the mandibular incisal edge on that temporary denture is close to being ideal as possible so that we can insert the implants in an ideal position relative to the incisal edge. 
And if you decide to place implant without using a fully guided surgery uh, protocol, it's very important that you mark the position of the implant before you start drilling. And during the osteotomy drilling, um, you need to be able to view your drilling angulation from all directions, as well as um, using paralleling, par paralleling pins to check the parallelism between the two osteotomies. The reason is because most denture locator abutment um, system allow up to 20 degree of divergence uh, between the two implants. As a matter of fact, the neobiotech ball locator attachment allow up to 20 degree of diversion, whereas the more recent, um, the Zest anchor, also known as the RX locators, allow 40 degree of diversion. But overall, um, multiple studies have shown that when you have more than 20 degree of divergence, this will lead to the loss of retention of the overdenture over time, um, as well as other prosthetic complications, such as um, wearing out of the metal, um, quicker wearing out of the metal housings, uh, wearing out the, the nylon inserts uh, inside the metal housing, as well as um, uh, calling, causing you know, um, metal abrasion on the locator abutment itself. Um, so for me, I really like having the parallel pin from Neobiotech because they are long and big, uh, which make it very easy for me to kind of handle them during surgery compared to a much smaller or even shorter parallel pin that you can see with other manufacturers. And um, I also want to point out is, is that when you use parallel pins, please don't do what I just did. What you want to do is um, you want to have your assistant kind of tie a floss to the pins for safety reason in case the pin is falling to the back of the patient throat. Um, I'm doing it this way because you know I'm doing this type of surgery on the regular basis, so I'm kind of comfortable. I'm getting a little bit more comfortable of not get using you know not tying the floss through the pins, but I think you should, you know, um, try to, to do that just for the patient safety reason. <clears throat> so here you see the post-op panel taken at the implant surgery and the picture of the lower jaw to show the insertion of the ball locator abutments and a complete post-op healing. And the picture on the right is um, the patient with the definitive maxillary complete dentures and a mandibular overdenture. So moving on to our third and final um, sample case. Um, the, this case involved um, a 67 years old male patient who came see me seeking for a solution with his uh, failing dentitions, um, which, was the which was the diagnosis given to him by his current medical provider and from having consultation with other um, dentists. And looking at his radiograph, um, it's very obvious that he has suffered from um, an advanced chronic periodontal disease um, radiograph radiographically, um, you can see a severe vertical, vertical bone loss uh, with bony defects and vocation involvement, as well as acute periodontal abscess um, throughout the mouth. Um, clinically, the opposite signs was, you know, poor plaque control, um, mobile teeth, um, changeable enlargement with um, significant, significant pocket depths and spontaneous bleeding when upon probing. Um, and the patient also had large um, bilateral mandibular tori, as well as both arches also has um, very large uh, nodule exostosis on the buccal. Um, the patients had heard about implant um, dentures, both the fixed and removable option from his previous dentist. And I explained to the patient that his teeth was um, terminal and need to be ex needed to be extracted. And I also explained the difference between the fixed implant denture as well as the removable implant dentures. And the, interest is, the interesting thing is um, the patient wife has been wearing dentures in her late 20s. So the patient and the wife, um, you know, discuss the choices and they select um, the final treatment to be a maximally complete denture and a mandibular overdenture. So with this particular patient, um, besides focusing on the implantology and the restorative aspect of the treatment, um, I kind of want to um, talk about the medical management of the patient during all phases of the treatment. So the patient explained to me that he's been taking um, met um, you know, metrobolol and has a, um, an extensive spine surgery about 15 years ago um, as a result of a work injury. And two years ago, he also had a heart attack and had an um, angioplasty and a stent placement operation as a result. And since then, he also been taking Coumadin um, on a daily basis um, and have and the patient had no other um, respiratory illness. 
And with the previous dental surgery uh, history question, what I really want to know from the patient is, had he experienced bleeding or bruising after a normal dental extraction and operation? Because that will give me an idea of how well, um, how well we can control his bleeding, right? <clears throat> and based on the patient medical conditions, um, I classify the patient as um, ASA class threes based on the American Society of um, Anesthesiologists guideline. And with, his, and with the history of taking Coumadin and having cardiovascular disease, um, I consulted with his physician to find out um, his, um, you know, INR, um, his platelet counts, as well as a uh, recommendation for um, antibiotic, antibiotic uh, prophylaxis. <clears throat> um, with regarding to the, um, you know, anticoagulant therapy, most medical um, professional um, advocate that this uh, discontinue anticoagulant before dental surgery to prevent um, excessive bleeding issue. Um, so the medical consultation report came back from the physicians um, showing the INR value of 3.5 and, um, and the physician recommended to discontinue Coumadin for about three days um, prior to the extraction appointment. And because of the half-life, the Coumadin vary on you know, the individual. Um, Coumadin need to be discontinued and it take about three to five days for full effect. Um, and I would like to quickly emphasize, you know, a few clinical caveats about um, anticoagulant therapy in dentistry. And literatures from the Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Facial Surgery by different group um, reported that many emboli complications in patients who were who were discontinued from the use of anticoagulant therapy for dental surgery. And um, as a matter of fact, the American Dental Association, the American Dental Association does not support um, routine discontinuation of oral anticoagulant therapy for patients before dental treatment. And other studies also um, shown that dental surgery can be safely performed on patients who receive um, anticoagulant therapy as long as their um, INR values are within um, the therapeutic range between three to 3.8.5. And because I was not comfortable with the patient um, INR value of 3.5, I sent a second request to his physician asking the physician if modif modification um, could be made to um, you know, allow the patient's um, INR value to be around three or below. So the physician continued to monitor the patient for several months and the second report came back showing an INR value of around three, which I was comfortable with. <clears throat> and it's important um, that I explain to you how I typically stage surgical treatment for a patient who is medically complex. Um, my first instruction to this patient is to take seven days antibiotic regimen and having a mouse rinse before um, full mouse um, scaling debridement appointment. And this is to decrease the, the amount of bacterial load and have some type of you know, positive soft tissue response before doing any type of surgery on the patient or even before doing any type of scaling on the patient. And considering all the medical factors that, that the patient have, I also decided to stage the extractions, which I did the extraction one arch at a time. So the maxillary um, extraction and the maxillary exotosis reductions was done um, on the same appointment. And after the extraction, patient wore an immediate denture as a transitional prosthesis. And after the extraction healing, um, I performed mandibular lingual, uh, lingual tori uh, removal uh, with the implant placement all on the same appointment. Um, the, reason is, the reason for staging um, the surgery was to see how the patient respond to the discontinuation of Coumadin and if um, local measure that we use to control the bleeding was effective. Um, the popular stress reduction protocol I typically do for a long restorative or surgical procedure for patients like this is to, put, to sedate the patient during the, procedure, uh, during the procedure with either um, intravenous or oral sedation. Um, in this case, the patient opted not to have any type of sedation done and mostly because of the cost of the, of the sedation and the fact that his wife um, who did come to the procedure, but she didn't drive. So when I have a situation like this, um, my stress reduction protocol is to set a very early morning appointment and try to minimize um, the amount of waiting time. 
and have um, adequate pain control with proper anesthesia and ensure that the duration of the anesthetics do not exceed um, the duration of the medication. I mean, so, I'm sorry, the duration of the procedure does not exceed the duration of the anesthetics. So as I mentioned before, um, mandibular tori um, and exotosis reduction was done for this patient um, at the same time as the implant placement on the mandible. Um, I will share with you the um, actual surgery video in a little later, um, but generally um, surgical resection of tori or exotosis is a very safe and predictable procedure with um, very minimum uh, post-operative post post complications. Um, the emphasis with this particular procedure is um, having proper precaution with flap incision and reflection, as well as having um, proper irrigation during bone reduction. Um, the possible complication you can expect with this uh, with um, tori removal is edema, um, possible injury to the salivary duct, um, possible perforation of the lingual um, cortical plate, um, wound dehiscence or infections. Um, lingual nerve injury is possible, but it's very, very rare. Um, also, when you do gross reduction of large tori, which you can see, that's what this patient have. Um, those growth reduction can lead to accumulation of the bone debris underneath the flap. Um, so that could cause, you know, wound dehiscence and compromised healing. So, you know, proper irrigation um, is a key. <clears throat> so, after the tori and um, tori removal and implant placement, my post-op regimen for the patients um, is, you know, very, very important. And I think it's just as important as doing the surgery. And my, ins my instruction for the patient is first stop diet. And then the patient would um, rinse with cohexin rinse twice a day until the incision line closes. And um, to keep the low denture in for the first 24 hour after the surgery, to kind of prevent um, any type of formation of hematoma. And um, the healing evaluation and suture removal uh, was performed at the at one week interval. And the patient was seen again at two week and fourth week. And at each appointment, the denture was, was relined um, with COSOP to provide tissue comfort and allow the tissue to adapt well to the denture. And this is the cone beam of the lower jaw um, after um, you know, full healing, um, after healing, um, after full healing, after the extractions. <clears throat> and as you can see, we have, you know, very excellent bone feel in the extraction socket. Um, we have very wide ridge form with thick buccal and lingual cortical plates. So here's the overall digital planning, which, you know, follow the exact guideline for the over denture implant I explained to you um, a little while ago. And so when we zoom in, to the cross section, the total restorative space needed for this patient was approximately about 16 millimeters, 16 millimeters because the position of the denture teeth for this particular case um, is relatively at the center of the ridge. And to achieve this restorative space, um, I, need, I also needed to reduce the crustal bone in the anterior region of the mandible roughly about two millimeters or so. So let me share the treatment video with you. Um, and to keep in mind that the several portion of this video was kind of truncated and sped up so that we have enough time to talk about other important subjects of this lecture.
So you can see the use of the um, paralleling pins during the osteotomy. Um, so that's the video. Um, and when it comes to his definitive overdenture prosthesis, um, the, the occlusion scheme is extremely important. And it's, the reason is because um, we only have two implants sustaining the occlusal load during function. We need to minimize the occlusal forces to the implant and prosthetic components by placing um, the forces in a vertical or long axis of the implants and perpendicular to the occlusion plane. Uh, what this means is that we need to follow a completed, complete denture occlusion scheme, which requires a balanced lingual eye occlusion, as well as um, eliminate any type of anterior guidance forces on the dentures. Uh, one, of the, one of the many things I, re, um, I reiterate to the patient at the end of the treatment is the need for um, having long-term prosthetic maintenance. And this included um, having an implant maintenance regimen, um, periodic checkup and replacement of the nylon inserts, uh, replacement of the locator abutments, as well as replacement of the overdentures every five to seven years. Um, so the short and the long-term maintenance costs basically should be communicated very clear to the patient before you initiate the treatment to avoid any type of surprises. And our job is not even finished um, with mandibular overdenture patient. To help the patient gain additional stability and support for the dentures, um, as well as to stop the posterior bone loss during the entire life of an over overdenture. The next goal of the treatment is to convert this overdenture to an implant supported overdenture. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we would be able to do so um, by um, placing additional implants distal to the two current implants so that we can convert an overdenture that is from a re uh, an implant retained to a full implant supported overdenture. And the two additional implants can either be placed um, behind or anterior to the mental foramen. And as recommended by Mish, the four implants should be connected with a bar um, that may or may not be cantilevered on the distal to tack um, occlusal forces off from the posterior residual ridge. And you know, so that way you can reduce the posterior bone loss. And finally, um, I wanna spend the last minute of the lectures to kind of talk about the um, maxillary overdenture treatment. And the reality that is that this, the maxillary overdenture treatment is a more complex treatment and we would definitely need more time to kind of go over. Um, however, a few key things that I want to mention. Um, first is because the shape and the diversion of the maxillary arch, the maxillary overdenture must be supported by four or more implants um, and with very minor support from the soft tissue or the bone and the implant are splinted with a bar, uh, which is the primary retention and, su and support for the, for the maxillary overdentures. And the, um, and the independent implants um, you see with the two implant um, mandibular overdenture is, are not an option for maxillary overdenture implant because the maxillary bone quality, um, because of you know, uh, the poor bone quality on the maxilla and different force directions um, you know, that would exert onto the maxilla, in this case, um, the palate might play a very, very small role in providing stability and support for the denture, and we typically don't count on it. Um, the reason is because um, most maxillary overdenture that you see does not include the palate. Um, the second point I want to make is the implant number and position is more important than the actual implant size when it comes to maxillary overdenture. Um, for the six implant positions, um, it's desirable to have implant placed in the lateral incisal position and also one in the canine position and then one in the second premolar position. So that way we can um, maximize the anterior posterior spread. So this pretty much um, conclude my presentations. Um, again, I wanna thank you everyone um, for your time. Um, and um, 
now I'm happy to answer any question that um, you might have. Anu, you still there? Hi, Doctor. Yes, thank you very much for your great lecture. I think we have a couple of questions from the Q&A and also one question from the chat box. Okay. All right. So um, we will address the question in the chat box first, okay? Great. Do you um, suggest a maxillary overdenture versus a complete denture? So I guess I'm going to assume the question is regarding to the maxilla. Um, <clears throat> it all depends. Um, you know, the benefit um, of doing a complete denture on the maxilla is having, you know, the palate which act as the primary support area as well as, um, you know, you have a more uniform ridge without any type of interference from the tongue. So most patients um, get by very, very well with a maxillary, you know, um, over complete dentures. Um, There's some that, you know, require um, better retention and stability, especially the one with, um, you know, moderate to severe um, maxillary bone loss. So that's where I kind of recommend the overdenture um, option for the maxilla. So I'm gonna to move to the question to the Q&A box. So the question is, is the denture scanning feature something common to all CBCT machine? If not, what is the alternative way to obtain the scan? Um, as far as I can tell, and I've been using um, multiple uh, scanning uh, machines, um, you know, from Planmeca to um, the Ray Scan offered by Neo Biotech, and I think I believe that they all have that features. And um, you know, if you know you could not find that feature on your Ray Scan machine, if that's the one that you have, then um, you know, just contact your um, your cell rep, and that person can schedule um, a maintenance appointment with you, and you know, have that set up for you. So the next question is, um, I checked the locator and at the time they have compatible parts with Neo Biotech. Do they have now or we have to use another implant profile that is compatible with Neo Biotech? So I think what you're referring to is the Zest anchors. Um, yes, um, if you're referring to the Zest anchors, yes, they do have um, um, the locator that's compatible with Neo Biotech. Um, and, um, you know, I can clarify with uh, Neo Biotech a little bit later, but I think they might be working on, you know, um, the cylindrical um, locators abutment type. But, you know, there are, um, you know, second sources that you can get, you know, um, locators that are, com you know, compatible with Neo Biotech implants. Okay. So, next question is what is MET when you mentioned Coumadin patient? Um, so MET, what it meant is meta, um, metabolic um, metabolism, um, I mean, sorry, metabolic um, capacity. So what it does is that it measure, it measure the patient functional capacity, and typically it comes with a series of questions with the score ranking from 1 to 10, right? And you don't want any score to be less than 4. So the typical question when you um, evaluate the MET functional capacity is, can the patient um, walk up, you know, one block without overexertion, or can he or she walk up a fly upstairs without, you know, overexerted himself or having, you know, um, increased heart rate. So next question is, um, what is ideal distance or recommended distance between the two implants as far as possible until there's no horizontal offset? So there's no um, specific um, distance for your between the two implants, as long as you know that the implant plays um, equally distant from the patient midline and the implant position between the lateral incisor and the canine position, you should be good to go. And that's where I would place my implants. Uh, next question, what was the total treatment length of time from the surgery to the definitive prosthesis? Okay, so the total treatment plan, it depends on if the patient is going to go through extraction with you or the extraction already been done, you know. So on an average, um, so if you think about after the extraction, it takes two months for the socket to fill, right, before you can do some type of preliminary implant surgery. And then it takes another two months or two, three months uh, for full osseointegrations. And then it takes another about, you know, 
a month or two months for you to go through the definitive uh, prosthesis fabrication process, including the impressions. So that totally about between six to seven months. So that's what that's how much time I would tell the patient. Um, and the second question from Dr. An, when perform full metal extraction for future overdenture, are you grafting the socket throughout the entire arch? Um, it, it all depends, you know, if the patient come in with severe periodontal defects, then yes. But if the patient just need, you know, simple extraction or even surgical extraction, then I would let the socket to, you know, um, heal naturally. And the reason, because study have shown that, you know, when you place, um, when you do socket preservations, um, the bone feel happen much slower. So, you know, if, that, that, if, if that's your intention is to have better bone feel and, you know, be preserving the crestal bone or the buccal plate, then yes, you know, um, and, you know, socket preservation is, you know, uh, can be considered. But if you would like to have the patient move through the treatment a lot faster, then you let the socket heal on its own. Um, questions, what is the best position for maxillary overdenture? So again, um, I point out that with the six implants, maxillary overdentures, you want to place the implants in the lateral incisor of the position and one in the canine position and one in the second premolar position. And, you know, and that will be, you know, um, bilateral on both sides. So that consists of six implants. Um, do you recommend reinforcing the overdenture with titanium mesh or different type of acrylic? Excellent, excellent question. Um, so yes, um, with mandibular overdentures, um, I don't typically reinforce um, uh, the mandibular overdentures um, unless, unless patients have like severely, um, severe, severely atrophied or resort rich. Uh, that's when I, you know, use um, titanium mesh or having kind of, you know, a custom uh, metal plate um, that support the dentures. Um, the metal plate would be processed with the dentures and, you know, that can kind of help with um, having proper orientation of the dentures um, and having, um, you know, strength for, for the denture itself. Um, for maxillary overdenture, however, uh, it's typically that we reinforce it with some type of titanium mesh and in cases where you have um, the palate removed from the dentures, in that case, it's a typical protocol to reinforce the denture with a custom uh, frame. Uh, what bird do you use to grinding or cutting the torus? Um, there's a special bird, um, and you can obtain that from Neobiotech. Um, it's used to cut, you know, for gross bone reduction. Um, last question here um, on the Q and A box regarding post-op instruction. What do you recommend with um, recommend the frequency of changing the locator nylons or proper changing proper charge for the maintenance? Um, so the nylon it all depends on the patient, you know, um, and also depends on what type of food they eat and how do they actually care for their denture, right? Because if they leave the denture out in the open space for a long time, then that could cause you know drying up of the nylons, causing it to wear out a lot faster. Um, so typically for my Overdenture patient, I would ask them to come see me um, twice a year, and that's when I replace the nylon insert. And so, typically, that the range for replacing the nylon insert between five to six months. Um, what you also want to evaluate is um, if the patient lose the nylon insert in the metal housing and they don't report it to you or they don't you don't see them um, every six months or so. Um, what that causes it will cause metal to metal contact, meaning metal on the metal housing contacting the metal on the locator abutments and what it causes is that a very aggressive wear out wearing of the locator abutment itself so you want to check um, on that also and if patient kind of report to you that hey they have they seem to lose the retention or lost some some loss of retention with their overdentures then you want to check to see if is it the locator abutment that need to be replaced or the nylon need to be replaced so i hope that answers the questions um, All right. Any more questions, guys? Uh, I think there's more on the chat box. Um, do you alter your treatment planning approach if the patient have class three occlusions? Um, excellent questions. You know, with overdenture um, overdenture patients, um, a class three occlusions, um, it's not so much of a, of a problem because with a conventional denture setup, 
which we would use in our overdenture setup. Um, the anterior teeth are not contacting anyway. Um, we don't have the anterior teeth in centric, um, you know, contacting each other. And then there's no um, anterior guidance on the anterior teeth. So the setup is still the same. You know, you would set up, you would um, do a denture, um, a denture teeth wax try-in to make sure that you achieve proper phonetic and aesthetic. And, you know, you try to set the denture teeth um, you know, relatively directly above the ridge press as possible. Sometimes you might have to, you know, um, bring it out facially a little bit to kind of correct the, um, the class three malocclusion issue. But overall, there's no issue with um, setting denture teeth um, in a class three occlusion. But one thing I do mention is that with the class three occlusion um, dentures, you, uh, for the posterior denture teeth, you want to use kind of, you know, a, um, a flat occlusion um, uh, denture teeth. So that way, you know, the patient have um, proper um, root functions when they move uh, laterally. All right, guys, any more questions? Doctor, I think that is it. Um... We answered all the questions and also um, thank you so much for this great presentation and also thank you so much for all these great questions and due to a limited period of time we have to move on to announcement and if you have any more questions um, regard to today's topic um, you will you know I definitely could connect with Dr. Tran directly through his email so his email is dr.owentrain at gmail.com I will also leave his email on the chat box so feel free to check on this and now I would like to move on to announce my part here all right thank you very much everyone <laughs> thank you so much doctor so stay connected with us on social media. Here is our Facebook is Neobiotech in USA and Instagram is Neobiotech underscore USA. And then the lastly, the YouTube channel is Neobiotech USA. And please follow us and you will see all this, our um, webinars, upcoming webinars. And you will also uh, watch the previous webinars on the YouTube channels. And uh, we also have the special uh, talk show as well on our YouTube channel so please um, check this out and if you are interested in taking our webinars you can find upcoming webinars in our website here at www.neobiotechusa.com and simply click on the education right here and you will see there's a drop down of the webinar and also previous webinars and click on the webinar then you will be on our webinar page and we will have a first 2020 Eurasia GAO core member meeting virtual, and it will be taking place on Friday, June 19th. The Roma time is actually from 12 to 3 p.m. and Dubai time is from 2 to 5 p.m. and the Korea standard time is from 7 to 10 p.m. at night. And it's actually on Thursday, June 18th at 3 a.m. midnight in our time, Pacific Coast time. So um, if you are able to join it, um, more than welcome to join this. And also most of the doctors from the Europe and Middle East and also Asia will join. Um, and that is why the time zone is more um, Eurasia uh, friendly. And then the second meeting is on actually Monday, June 29th. Um, at the same time. And during this meeting, the GAO directors and also the core members will share their clinical experiences and also updated um, research data. And we sure it will be, you know, uh, incredible time of learning and networking, and which really can help us push out limits in implant um, dentistry. So if you are interested in joining this meeting, please contact GAO forum. And uh, here's the contact info. And I will also leave this contact info on the chat box. So, and you will receive a joining link from them. And we will have a great lecture coming up on next Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Coast time on meets and guide effects on guided implant surgery with Dr. Spencer Park, which is a actually three hours lecture. So you will receive a three uh, C credits. So don't miss out. And also we have on uh, Sunday as well, June 28th with Dr. Kent Huang on topic of implant surgical and prosthetic complications 
FR and SR at the same time, 10 o'clock in the morning. And all these courses are first come first serve basis. So please, please register in advance and reserve your spot. And if you miss any of these uh, great lectures, you can watch it on our website and click on education again and see the drop down. There's the previous webinars and you'll be on this previous webinars page. And thank you very much for, for those who stayed until the end and as part of our ongoing effort to provide a better continuing education courses, we would like to request your feedback via a short course evaluation. And one of our sales rep will email you um, if you stayed until the end and if you join this webinar today um, and to complete the course evaluation. And after you receive it, please fill it out and um, submit it as soon as possible because we will send you CE open completion of this evaluation form. And this form should take no longer than five minutes complete. It's very simple. And I would like to say thank you very much for participating in today's webinar. And we really hope to see you again next time. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, here's, a, here's my email, ion.chy and neobiotechusa.com. Right, I would like to say thank you very much all doctors who participated in it. And thank you also Dr. Chuen for a great uh, presentation today as well. And in a, in a minute, I will leave um, Dr. Trin's email address on the chat box. So here we go, I'll just do this. Um, in case that if you have any further questions, feel free to contact uh, Dr. Trin. And also the second email is actually if you are interested in joining the core member meeting, you can directly uh, connect with the GAO forum. So, uh, okay, great, great. I think we will have to end this webinar here today. So thank you very much, um, everyone. And we hope to see you again next time and please stay healthy. And I'll, I will end the webinar here. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Chen, and I will hope you um, hopefully meet you next time again. Right. Absolutely, thank you so much, Anyun. Have a great Sunday. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. Bye bye.